to Revelation chapter 2. Thank you for the singing this morning, congregational and special singing. I enjoyed every minute of it. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5. The title of the message this morning is Candlestick. The Bible says in verse 5, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. You might notice it says remove the candlestick out of his, his, his place. Think about that. In the book of Revelation, we have the message to the seven churches, which are listed as Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Our text in verse 5 is in the message to that first church called Ephesus. The aged John, the beloved as he was called by the Lord, was the pastor of the church at Ephesus who wrote this book of Revelation. And he wrote it while he was in exile on the Isle of Patmos, sometime before A.D. 89. He died about 10 years later and was the last of the apostles to die. Kind of strange, John was boiled in scalding oil and survived. Amazing. I got a feeling that he didn't look exactly like most people did. His skin had been boiled in all. You think about a burned victim. John was a burned victim. But obviously, as he wrote this from the Isle of Patmos, he had been removed from the church at Ephesus. And I'm sure that he was removed probably because of the persecution of the Roman government and under the terrible Emperor Domitian. The full message to the church at Ephesus is important for us to look at this morning. It is found in verses 1 through 7 of chapter 2. Let's read that together. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou, how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast, tr hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of, the place, out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. My thoughts this morning are on this candlestick. And as is my habit, any time that I have a subject in mind, 
I always refer to the rule of first mention, which means go to the place where the candlestick is first mentioned. And there you will find some great truths. So we find the first mention of the candlestick in Exodus 25. So if you will turn there, I want to read several verses about the candlestick in Exodus 25. I'll read verses 31 through 35. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made, his shaft and his branches. His bowls, his knops, and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Three bowls made like unto almonds with a knop and a flower in one branch, and there and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch with a knop and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick. And in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with their knops and their flowers. And there shall be a knop under two branches of the same and a knop under two branches of the same and a knop under the two branches of the same according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. I think I'll just stop right there. You can read the rest of it. Maybe I ought to, but just refer to that, and I think you'll get the idea as we go through the message. But there are plenty more there to read is what I'm trying to say. That's the first mention of a candlestick in the Bible. And I'm thinking about that. This is a wonderful piece of furniture in the tabernacle. Amen. It has many thoughts and themes of which we are going to cover. But many people think of this when they think of the candlestick. This is not what is described in the Bible. This one has four on each side, as you can tell, and one in the middle. Now the reason for this menorah that you see in the Jewish religion and in their customs, the reason that you see this is because of a war that uh, the Maccabees had with the Syrians and there was 40,000 Syrians and just a few thousand Jews in the Maccabees and fought a great battle in the second century BC. And those few Jews defeated the 40,000 Syrians. And the Maccabees came back to Jerusalem to take all the things that defiled the temple out of the temple and get all the abominations of the foreign nation of Syria and move it out and destroy it. And as they moved out all the things of idol worship and abominations of the Syrian invaders, they found one cruise of oil that had never been contaminated by anything or touched by the Syrians. So in this temple, with all its defilement, they found one cruise of oil that was not contaminated. They took that cruise of oil and filled up the seven menorah or candlestick that you read about, that I read about in the Bible. They filled it up with that one cruise of oil and lit the seven lamps. In doing so, they were purging the temple of all defilement and they were also bringing the light of the glory of God back to the temple. Praise God for that. All this is a good background story. But that cruise of oil lasted eight days. And because of that cruise of oil burning for eight days, they redesigned the candlestick. Instead of having six, three on each side and one in the middle, they put four 
for the eight days that that cruise of oil burned. And now they have a, a celebration called Chinookia that represents the victory that was given on those particular days. And they light one for each day in that celebration. Now here's the thought that I want to say about the temple furniture. Every single piece of the temple furniture or the tabernacle furniture, either one, pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. So here are some things that point to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this one looks silver, but the one that they had, it's even got the price still on the back of it. I declare I paid $2 for it at a yard sale yesterday. All right. Well, here it is. Here, it was made out of gold, pure gold. And its seven lights, of course, stand for the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and for Jesus Christ, who is the light. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he's also called the light. Is that correct? Amen. And then he says to us believers, ye are the light of the world. So the lights represent the light of Jesus Christ. And so it's all pointed to Christ and the light that he has through us. Then, of course, this gold represents the deity of Jesus Christ. I mean, he's all God. Is that right? He's all God, no doubt about it. And then the buds and the flowers that we mentioned represent the new life or the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the central shaft, the center one in that original one, which had seven and there would be one more, six, three on each side, and that one more would be seven. The seventh one in the center represents the communion because these are all coming off of the center one, the communion that the believer has with Jesus Christ. And so I'm thinking about this thing of communion with Jesus Christ, each one of us. Do we really have this communion and union with Jesus Christ as we should? Now, I'm getting to a point. Many people will say this about this menorah or about the candlestick, and I prefer to call it the candlestick because this eight with one more, nine, is the menorah. The candlestick didn't have those nine. But I'm wondering if we really have the communion and union with Christ as we know that we should have. I know we are united with Christ. I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. Don't you know that? But I wonder if we really are experiencing the union and communion that we ought to in Christ. But many scholars, as I was about to say, believe that this total candlestick represents the church and Jesus Christ, of course. And so here you have, and we're going to find out something very important here before. I, I said some people believe it represents the church, but I'm going to tell you more about it. So don't say that I categorically stated that that candlestick represents the church, but many people say it represents the church. So the Bible from beginning to end is a testimony of Jesus Christ and God's merciful plan of redemption. So this light was in the tabernacle, and if you know anything about the tabernacle, there were no windows in the tabernacle. Amen? Everybody know that? No windows in the tabernacle. The only light in the tabernacle was the candlestick. In other words, natural light will not do when it comes to divine worship. Is that right? Our natural inclinations, our natural light, it will not. We must have the divine light of God to worship God. Amen. I'm glad I've got the inspired word of God, aren't you? I'm glad I've got Jesus Christ who is the light. I'm glad that you are the light of the world. But that is referring, of course, again to the church, I believe. So he, God has taken his children, believers, out of darkness into light. And that is the idea of this, into his marvelous light. That's 1 Peter 2, 9. So the candlestick, not this menorah, but the candlestick is the background of our text. It is found in the message to the church at Ephesus. J. Vernon McGee writes this about the church at Ephesus or about Ephesus itself. 
Ephesus had a population of 225,000 people. Now that's about the size of Richmond, Virginia. That is three times the size of Greenville, South Carolina. And Greenville, of course, is growing. It wouldn't surprise me if they didn't reach the 225,000 one day. But Ephesus was three times the size of our Greenville. Ephesus was not only a beautiful city, it was the chief city of the present province of Asia. It was called the Vanity Fair of Asia. Pliny called it the Light of Asia. It was both the religious and commercial center for that entire area which influenced both East and West Europe and Asia. It was here in Ephesus that Paul had his greatest ministry. And it was here that that great apostle John the Beloved had his church or pastored the church. This city was first formed by Alexander the Great and he formed it or constructed it around the temple of Diana which became one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The largest Greek temple ever constructed, four times larger than the Parthenon at Athens. The word Ephesus means desirable. And surely the church at Ephesus should be known as desirable because it was the apostolic church. And I don't mean that the way it's meant today in other places, but this was the church of the first century. The, we would call it the first church, so to speak. Not necessarily forgetting about Jerusalem and Antioch. But Pliny called Ephesus the light of Asia, and we should call the church at Ephesus the light of the world for Jesus Christ. So that church at Ephesus was a light to a great part of the world at that time. But I'll tell you what this candlestick stands for is found in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20. And here's what the Lord says about the candlestick. Revelation 1.20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, I don't think it takes much study to understand that the word angel means messenger. So there were seven messengers or angels of the seven churches. And I don't think it takes much to understand that churches have pastors that are messengers of God. Is that right? Yeah. And so the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So notice this, that even Jesus Christ says that the candlesticks, especially each one, of those branches stands for the each church, those seven churches. So it's not beyond the pale of human reasoning and neither divine reasoning that we should call this candlestick the church and all that it represents in Jesus Christ. All the deity, all the light of the glorious revelation of God, all the new life represented by the knops and the flowers and so on, all the resurrection, all of that, the light, the gold, the flowers, all of that, every bit of it, the union with Christ in the middle, all of that, and the church represents every bit of that. So you got the church and Christ and everything about it represented in that candlestick. Now, the message to the church at Ephesus is what I want to kind of zero in on now. The message has three parts. Praise, sin, and rebuke. 
Now, here's the thing about this particular message. Notice the beauty of this message. It starts with praise. Now, the Lord is going to tell Ephesus something very hard in the end of the message, something very difficult for them to accept. In other words, they had left their first love, which was Christ himself. And he's going to tell them that, but he doesn't start out saying, I got something against you, boys. You've left your first love. He didn't start out that way. He started out with praise. Now, what were some of those things of praise? Number one, they had been faithful laborers for the Lord. And I can say this with all my heart. There are many, many, many people in many churches who labor hard and work hard. There are many people in this church who labor and work hard for the cause of Christ here in this place. So there's a praise for the labor. And then in verse 2, there's also the praise that they knew what was true and they didn't fall for the falsehood. So they were no way going to fall for something that was false. They knew what bad doctrine was. They knew what wrong doctrine was. And they knew the truth. And I got a good feeling <clears throat> that I can say the same thing about us here at Good News Baptist Church. I can say, I believe we know the truth. And we can spot error when we see it. And we can point it out. And we can expose it. So we are good about that. No doubt about it. All God's people need to know what is right and what is wrong when it comes to doctrine. Amen? They don't need to be just blank about that and act like it doesn't exist. So they were laborers. They discerned truth. And then they endured suffering in verse 3 without fainting. There was a lot going on there, a lot of persecution. But they endured that and did not faint. Now, folks, we haven't come to the persecution that I think is coming. I think America, if it keeps going like she is, will soon be calling what we do hate speech. And if they start calling us hate speech, then the next thing you know, they're going to try to make laws against it, and our preaching would become breaking the law. And then there are going to be some people be put in jail. I believe that's coming. I believe that's coming. But these people were definitely enduring persecution and not fainting at all. They were, I mean, holding up under the persecution. And then they held to pure doctrine. I'll just say a quick thing about the Nicolaitans that the Lord said that they hated and that he hated. That could be a beginning of a structural hierarchy like the Catholic Church has now. It could have been that. Or it could have been the Gnostic heresy creeping into the church that permitted all kinds of immorality. So there's two thoughts about the Nicolaitans, either that establishment of a hierarchy or either the permitting of idolatry. But here John now has left the church at Ephesus, been removed by the emperor Domitian or some of his uh, soldiers. So he had been pastor there from A.D. 66 to somewhere around 81 or 96, somewhere in that neighborhood. Well, he wrote this uh, revelation before 89, and the revelation was finished at 89. So somewhere between 66 and 89, he had pastored that church and now was on the Isle of Patmos. 100 years later, one century later, the church at Ephesus did not even exist. They were gone. What happened? There was one thing that the Bible says happened. They left their first love. They left their first love. They had everything else right, but they left their first love. And the church disappeared. Do you know what I believe? When I, what I just said, the candlestick was removed. It ceased to exist. I can remember, and I hope nobody takes offense at this, but 
I, I, I'm known to say what I think, whether people take offense or not, and I hope that you don't mind me being straightforward and right out front with you. I remember in days gone by when the soul of Bob Jones University was souls for Jesus. I can still remember the packed out concert center, now the Stratton Hall, I believe, with preacher boys in it singing to the top of their lungs, souls for Jesus is our battle cry. Souls for Jesus will fight until we die. We never will give in while souls are lost in sin. Souls for Jesus is our battle cry. I remember that. Dave remembers that too. I knew that those boys lived that because I was part of it. I was a receiver of their zeal for souls because June and I were down in Lawrence at Faith Baptist Church along with other young people in the church and boys from Bob Jones University came every Friday or Saturday to Lawrence, South Carolina and held a young people's meeting in the upstairs of the fire department or actually it was fire department and police station so there was three floors and on the third floor was a big open room with oak flooring and we met up there and played games and did Bible quizzes and did sword drills and sang songs and, and had preaching of God's word every Saturday night. That's where we got our good preaching foundation from young Bob Jones boys full of wanting to reach souls for Christ. I remember that. I remember one fellow that called me just not too long ago. My mom passed away, I think, in 2016, and one of those boys that had come down to Lawrence, South Carolina, for several years, his name was Paul Bostick, red-headed boy. And Paul called me after Mama passed away and said, I, I just wanted to offer my condolences to the family. I didn't know who, who else to call and I got your number somehow, and so he called me and talked to me. And we reminisced about the days with the young people's meetings on the top of the police station there. <clears throat> Paul Bostick, now a doctor and pastor of Maranatha Baptist Church in Belleville, Michigan, never forgot those days. And Paul Bostick never forgot those days. Now Dr. Paul Bostick never forgot them. And I will never forget them either. I remember those days of great love for the Lord and love for the souls of men. I'm not going to make a statement that puts a blanket statement on any institution or any person. But I will make this statement with a broad brush. Any group of people whether it's Good News Baptist Church or Bob Jones University or any other church in this country, if they lose their zeal for souls and Christ, they have left their first love. It's that simple. It's that simple. So now the next thing, there was praise, first of all, and then there was their sin, second of all, and then next is the rebuke. The Lord told them what they must do. He said, remember. He's going to do the remember, repent, and repeat. You're going to get those three R's. He says in verse 5, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place. You say, preacher, what are you doing? I'll tell you one thing I'm doing. I'm preaching for the preservation of Good News Baptist Church. I'm not only preaching for the preservation of Good News Baptist Church, I'm preaching for the preservation of all godly churches in this area. But if we don't get this first love stuff straight, we are going to lose, we're going to have the candlestick removed. Amen? Amen. Think about it. I don't want to be a, a doomsday prophet here, but you know what's going to play. play. He said, you repent, you repent, of leaving, they left their first love, and I think I can put the word leave in there, but they left their first love, and he said, you repent of that, or I'm going to take the candlestick away. I'm going to remove it. 
simply this. First, they had to remember from whence they had fallen. In other words, what were the first things? And what I just did to you when I related to you about what went on in Lawrence when I was a young teenager, when that I was remembering, like the Lord told the church to do here, remember what you used to do. So there is some things about the past that we can remember that we should remember and should take it to heart. Now, we can't live in the past and we can't live on the law. Here's what we do. We remember the past and live on it like we're doing what we used to do. You can't live in the past and say, we've already done it and we don't have to do it anymore. You can't live like that on the laurels of the past, but you must remember how it was when the zeal of God was in your heart. Remember. And just don't say, I've done it. I've been there. Hey, it's awful easy for older folks to say, I've done my part. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. We have not done our part until we are six feet under or until Jesus comes. Amen. Amen. Can you imagine a church without the light of God, without re re revelation and illumination, can you imagine a church without the communion and the union of Jesus Christ? Can you imagine a church without deity in it, without Jesus Christ, the God man in it? Can you imagine a church with Jesus being missing? Can you imagine the presence of God and all that that represents, all that this represents? Can you imagine that being missing from a group of people that call themselves a church? I'll tell you what it would be. If all of this was missing, it would simply be a social gathering. Social gathering where people meet and eat. It would be a degradation into idol worship with a compromising club of personalities showing partialities. If the Lord saw a church, so-called church like that, you know what he would do? He would ride by and he would take that sign out there and he would cross out Good News Baptist Church. Instead of Good News, he would put Ichabod Baptist Church. The glory is departed. So the first thing they were to do is to remember. The second thing they were to do is to repent. Now I wish to goodness, somehow or another, this old hard head of mine and hard heart of mine and soul that is dull of spiritual things could really get to this bottom line here on repentance. But I don't know about you, but there's not a person in this building, including me and especially me, that does not need to come to the realization that we must repent. Period. No excuses. Right? None whatsoever. We cannot excuse what, well, we've done this, well, we've done No, no excuses. No sidetracking. Nothing else. I'm not able. No, no nothing. Anybody can repent. I don't care if it, how old they are, how young they are, how good they've been or how bad they've been. Anybody can repent. Anybody. We all have that privilege. It's a privilege. And we ought to. He said, repent. He, he said, I, and remove, I will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. And then I want to give you the Job passage. Here's the way Job repented. Since I don't know all, all that I need to know about repentance, there's so much discussion about this that sometimes it makes me mad. But since I don't know all about it, I'm going to look at Job. I think it's good to look at the Bible instead of trying to hear some Dr. Bottle Stopper talk about it. Amen? Job said this about repentance. I abhor myself. I wonder how many of us can say that. 
Job says, I abhor myself. And then he goes on to say, and repent in dust and ashes. But before he repented, he said, this Job is a stinking, rotten rascal. Now that sure doesn't fit with today's society, does it? Today's society says, you tell yourself that you are something. And that's even being preached in workshops, in fundamental Baptist camp meetings, churches, and everything else. I know we're something in Jesus Christ, but, but before we get to that point where we know what we are in Christ and how we're God's children and his chosen people and how he shows grace and shows mercy and favor, do you know something? Before we jump over to that favor and to that great place of prominence where we're so-called in the very presence of God and in his favor, love and favor, and the love and compassion and all that, before we get to that place, folks, there's somebody somewhere has to say, I abhor myself and agree with God that we're not worth a nickel. I don't know about you, but just being in Christ is not about me. It's about Christ. You see, I shouldn't be saying how good I can preach or how good I can pray or how good I can sing or how good I can drive. Gail knows I drive perfect. She told me yesterday she'd been scared of my driving ever since we started dating. And I think I drive just perfect. I know I don't, but anyway. Hey, but no matter what, no matter what, we ought to learn this principle and do it, repentance. Ezekiel said this, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent and turn yourself from your idols and turn away from your faces from all your abominations. So Ezekiel is saying, Here's another thing. Job says, I abhor myself. And Ezekiel says, turn from your idols and all the abominations. Turn from them. That's what Ezekiel said, repentance. You say, preacher, what is repentance? Oh, you say, it's a godly sorrow for sin and you get all these definitions from all these characters. Wait just a minute. Get it from the Bible, Ezekiel says. Turn from your idols. That's what he said. Well, then I'll tell you, folks, we're going to have to do some turning from some idols. Now, I don't have time to preach the next seven idols. I want to. But somebody made a list of America's seven idols. And I thought number one would be money and wealth and things like that. But I'm just going to, I'm, I'm just going to, I can't preach all these. I got a lot of notes here. But they, here's what they said. The number one idol in America is professional sports. I didn't say that. I'm just quoting somebody. Now, some of these in here I'm not sure I agree totally with, but I'm just giving you what somebody else said. I got to go on. Number two, they said the next idol is college sports. Whoa. Boy, that tears up a bunch of Christians. I know Christians that would rather wear Clemson or Gamecock apparel than they would wear a Gideon pin or wear a church attendance pin or wear anything else that had anything to do with God. You give them a hat that said God is great, put that aside, but they'll wear that Clemson or that Gamecock hat. Come on. I said I wasn't going to preach all these idols, but I'm doing it. And then they said number three was fame and celebrity. And listen, folks, I don't, I don't want to get on a hobby horse here, but I know Christian women that think more about getting their daughters into the beauty pageant than they do getting them to the mission field. Fame and celebrity, number three. Number four, and this is supposed to be in order of importance, the automobile. Good night alive. I never thought about that, but I guess that's one of them. Boy, we sure do love our automobiles, don't we? I met a guy. I said I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to anyway. I met a guy that had a 1962 Corvette. Woo! He was about 75, 80, somewhere in that, I don't know, 75 maybe. And I mean, I said, let me tell I got a picture of it on my phone. I said, let me take a picture. Gail asked him, you know, Gail knew she does all the dirty work. <laughs> she helps me out. But anyway, so we got a picture of this guy and his Honduran orange. I don't know where in the world. In 1962, they came up with Honduran orange. But a Honduran orange is kind of a rusty red looking color. And I mean, that thing had a 327 in it. 
Oh, man. My heart did a flip-flop. I'm serious as a heart attack, man. I, I was drooling all down. I mean, drooling. I said, what? tell me about this car. And he started telling me all about it. And he said, I had one brand new I bought from the dealership in Spartburg. It was brand spanking new. And said, then my daughter came along and I had to sell it. He said, so not too long ago, said, I found one like it out in California with 30,000 miles on it. I said, are you kidding me? A 62 Corvette with 30,000? Yeah. And he said, I drove out there with a trailer and I picked that thing up and brought it back here and had it repainted the Honda and Orange business, make it look better. And he said, I drive it every day and love it. Man, I hope he dies soon and he wills that to me. I don't know about you folks, but cars kind of crank my motor. But that is it true that automobiles are God? Is that true? It was to that guy. Number five, and I don't know about this one, but number five, and I want you to say, I want to say something real quick. I got to quit, but number five is guns. Now, I think that I believe, and I know I do, I believe in the right to bear arms. That is a right. Amen? Amen. But guns have become a real problem in America. I don't care what the liberal left says. I don't care what anybody, National Rifle Association. I mean, people are toting guns everywhere. Is that right? This looks like the Wild West nowadays. We had somebody in this church that used to carry a gun, and there was actually two of them, and now you don't know which one I'm talking about, but he carried a gun, and I was more afraid of him shooting somebody than I was somebody coming in the door. Guns. I, I'm not saying I agree with this being an idol, but it sure is pretty high on the list. Amen? And then number something here, I see where I am. Number six, and I thought this was number one, money, riches, and I, listen, I ain't got time to tell you this, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> Do you know Colonial Pipeline just paid $4.4 million in ransom money? You know how many Bitcoins that is? 75. 75 Bitcoins. And guess what? They had 2.7 million bitcoins. Colonial Pipeline had 2.7 million bitcoins. They only paid 45 million, 45 bitcoins. That's a lot of money. Is that right? How many of you know that's a lot of money? They had a hundred billion dollars in the bank. That's about 2.7 million bitcoins. Well, anyway, you know what? I don't care what anybody says, America is drunk on wealth. Drunk on it. You take AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, started out with zero, and now she's worth $100,000 now, $100,000. Now, that's a real socialist. Start out with a zero and become a, a hundred thousand dollar value now. I mean, if I was a socialist, I'd start out with zero and end up in the minus. Wouldn't you? If you was a socialist, I mean, here's a real socialist now worth a hundred thousand more than she was. That's really a socialism. I'm telling you. Now, I, now the last one, and I don't know if I agree with this or not, but the last idol of America is national security. You know, that kind of strange to me. I mean, here we've got so many people fighting and protesting and beating up this one and killing this one and that. I can't imagine national security is under attack. But national security is considered a God. Now, I want to say something right quick. I don't know if all those seven, you could, hear, you could just, you could say all those seven that I just mentioned are permeated with false deities, false gods, the God of self, the God of technology, the God of social media, and the God of status or popularity. You put all of them in a bag if you want to. That's called polytheism. That's what the Hindus believe in, many gods. God of the tree, God of the dirt, God of this one, God of the animals. 
Hey, we are a polytheistic society now. We have many gods. And it's not just in the world, it's in the church. So what did the Lord tell the church at Ephesus to do? According to Ezekiel, run, get remove those false idols, get out from those false idols, take, that's repentance. Repentance is getting rid of the false idols. And then the last thing is repeat. Now there's remember, repent, and then repeat. It says, do the first works. That's in verse 5. Do the first works. In other words, whatever you used to do when you had that first love, whatever you used to do when you had that first love, do it again. When you first got saved, were you happy? How many of you were happy when you first got saved? Amen. Amen. Then what's wrong now? When you first got saved, did you tell somebody else, hey, I got saved? Did you do that? Well, what's wrong with it now? There's nothing wrong with doing what you did when you first got saved. Do it again. That's what he's saying. 